The following three news special is sponsored by Swage Lock. Our components support some of the most critical applications on the planet and beyond. Hello and welcome to a three news special Inside Artemis. I'm Betsy Kling at Kennedy Space Center where today has been quite the roller coaster ride. Started off early morning thinking that thunderstorms were going to be the big problem. There was a 55 minute delay in the countdown. Then they started tanking, which means they're filling the rocket with the propellant. There was a problem with that. A small leak developed. They decided that wasn't such a big issue, so they finished filling that rocket up. Then they started into the rest of the series of all of the intricate details to get everything powered up and ready for launch. And at about 40 minutes, there was a known pause that they were going to be taking and during that pause more complications were found namely there was some frost on the outside of the core stage they thought that could be indicative of a leak and it was not but then came the big one engine three was having some problems with some temperature testing and then it really started to fall apart from there they decided to scrub the entire launch for today and it just goes to show you how incredible these machines are so the NASA engineers will be headed out to the launch pad tomorrow to take a look at everything. But I got to tell you, it was a little bit disappointing for all the folks out here on the lawn. And I think you'll, you'll see that it was very disappointing for the folks inside the control room. So we've got a uh, mission management team meeting at uh, 3 p.m. Eastern. We're going to give the team time to rest, first of all, and then come back fresh tomorrow and reassess um, what we learned today and then uh, develop a series of options. It's too early to say what the options are. And frankly, engine three that Mike talked about, we definitely didn't get down to the temperature we wanted, but the other four weren't as low as we would like to. So, so there's some things going on that um, the, teams were, the team needs to go off and look at the data and understand how this is different from what we did during the green run at, at Stennis. Um, and then figure out a path forward. As I said, this is an incredibly complex machine and Artemis 1 is a test flight, the first in a series of increasingly complex missions that will take humans deeper in space than ever before. But this first test flight of NASA's next generation of hardware and software is getting a critical first step in getting there. Artemis is the Greek goddess of the moon and twin sister to Apollo. And as the namesake for NASA's new deep space exploration program, it's a nod to where we're going and where we've been. That's one small step for man. And to all of us that gaze up at the moon, dreaming of the day humankind returns to the lunar surface, folks, we're here. We are going back. And that journey, our journey, begins with Artemis 1. Artemis 1, the first flight bringing together the most powerful rocket in the world with a new human space capsule and all the upgraded infrastructure back here on Earth to make it a success. NASA built this mission on a solid foundation of know-how, creating more power, more technology, and more capability to propel us farther from Earth than ever before. There are four objectives with this uncrewed first flight. Priority one is making sure the Orion space capsule returns safely, and it's no small feat. Orion will be coming in faster and hotter than any human-capable spacecraft before, reaching speeds of up to 25,000 miles per hour and temperatures of up to 5,000 degrees. Engineers will closely follow how Orion's heat shield performs. Its re-entry conditions are so extreme, no facility on Earth can recreate them. This will truly be a one-of-a-kind test. Next, retrieving the Orion capsule after splashdown. Nothing will give engineers better information for how Orion performed than the capsule itself. They will also retrieve the parachutes that slowed its descent through the atmosphere. Third, testing out all that new gear. From the launch pad to the rocket system's precision time separation, the capsule's navigation, and of course, the return to Earth, Every facet of hardware and software debuted in this new era of space exploration will be scrutinized. And of course, there's a lot of science packed in, even if people are not. And the experiments on board, from deploying mini satellites to how intense radiation will affect electronics and future astronauts, 
there's more than just rocket science happening here. On its 43-day journey, Artemis 1 will cover 1.3 million miles, equivalent to more than 50 trips around the world. And this is just the critical first step of several, with eyes set on a lunar outpost and beyond in the next decade. But our eyes are focused, not the immediate future, but out there. It's a future where NASA will land the first woman and the first person of color on the moon. And on these increasingly complex missions, astronauts will live and work in deep space and will develop the science and technology to send the first humans to Mars. You may notice that some of the components of this Artemis 1 rocket look familiar. The core stage and solid rocket boosters look like those of the space shuttles, and the Orion capsule sure does look like the Apollo capsules that took astronauts to the moon in the 60s and 70s. NASA has taken tried and true designs, upsized them, and outfitted them with the modern technology to make this Artemis mission a reality. But it's a delicate balance between progress and protection. We're building a little bit at a time. Um, and when humans are involved, innovation happens at a pace that still keeps them safe. So that's a, a tough balance. After each one of these missions, we have to innovate. We have to learn. That's why we do a test flight. That's why we do an uncrewed test flight before we put crew on there. Future crew safety is top of mind for NASA in this first test flight of the Artemis program. And of course, the Orion capsule is a particular focus because right now it is the only spacecraft capable of deep space flight and high speed return from the moon. And NASA has been working on this for nearly 20 years. It is not your grandfather's Apollo. It is a marvelous machine. Orion may look old school. Just the capsule alone has, you know, tens of thousands of pieces that come from suppliers all across the, the nation. But it's packed with all new tech and the capability to take humans deeper into space than ever before. You know, physics hasn't changed in 50 years. Um, almost everything else on Orion has changed. A life-supporting capsule that is the most advanced technology to leave Earth. The number one thing is, is computer. This is the whole avionics system. All of that is outfitted and completely different from what we used before. You know, once we get the displays and controls for the, uh, the astronauts in there, you know, it's not going to be the old switches that we had in the space shuttle. It's going to be, you know, touch screens. It's going to be a lot of more digital technologies. We've got two million lines of software code in this vehicle. There's in the neighborhood of a thousand different sensors on it. Tested hundreds, even thousands of times. Every new spacecraft development runs into challenges. Um, things we find in, in the testing that didn't quite work right, and so we go figure out what went wrong, we fix it, and then go and fly. And it's changing the way we fly. The machine is, is very marvelous that the crew don't have to be pilots anymore. They can be scientists and medical doctors and such to be able to do exploration. As mentioned, when Orion returns, it'll be coming in faster than any spacecraft before, and that means heat. And once the astronauts are on board, that means the stakes couldn't be higher. February 1st, 2003. Space Shuttle Columbia disintegrated on re-entry, killing seven astronauts. An investigation pointed to failure of Columbia's heat shield, damaged during launch. It's a disaster still on the minds of many as NASA begins a new generation of human spaceflight, going farther and overcoming new challenges. When you come back in from a distant place like the moon as opposed to the space shuttle, you're going much faster. And uh, when you do your re-entry, um, it's a lot hotter and faster, right? So that translates into a lot of heat on the heat shield. The heat shield's Apollo-like design deflects the heat of re-entry, while 180 blocks of an outer material called Avcoat erodes as it heats up in order to carry the heat away. Measuring 16 and a half feet wide, it's the largest heat shield of its kind, though only 1.6 inches at its thickest. You come in, it's about 5,000 degrees at the bottom of the heat shield, 25,000 miles an hour barreling through the atmosphere. And on a crewed mission, the crew's only going to be about three or four feet away from that. Three or four feet from 5,000 degrees. And the difference between life and death a 1.6 inch membrane that is eroding away. And the only way you can test it is to get it out there and let it come in at 32 Mach. 
Straight ahead on Inside Artemis, the crew inside the uncrewed capsule, a look at the special high-tech mannequins making their way to space and how they will help keep astronauts safe. Plus, these little cubes could be big for the future of science, how a volunteer group's project is making its way onto Artemis One. And before the break, ever wonder how NASA picks a launch window? Well, several things factor into that decision. Where the payload is going, the sun requirements for energy, rocket fuel efficiency, collision avoidance, and return and recovery in daylight. We'll be right back. I am very proud of this launch team. They have solved several problems along the way, and they got to one that needed time to be solved. Welcome back to Inside Artemis. Behind every mission is a team on the ground making sure things run smoothly. Mission control is an iconic and critical part of NASA, based at Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. Three, two, one, and liftoff. Once the Artemis One solid rocket boosters fire, the launch team hands over the reins to Mission Control at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. Here, the flight control team will be flying Orion. The engineers that are sitting at the console, they're the, they're the people that really have the deep technical knowledge. Every command, every milestone is marked by watchful eyes, but they aren't working alone. Katie Oridi manages the Mission Evaluation Room, or MER. If something goes wrong or the flight control team has a question about kind of a funny signature that we're seeing in vehicle performance, uh, the MER is the team that goes off and does any supporting analysis or digs back through our history of data to see if we've seen stuff like that before. And then we make recommendations to the flight control team. Uh, Houston, we've had a problem. America was introduced to the mission evaluation room in 1970. During the ill-fated Apollo 13 mission, an oxygen tank ruptured, crippling the spacecraft carrying three astronauts 200,000 miles from Earth. Engineer Arturo Campos and his team in the MER went into action to find a way to reroute the electrical system, giving the astronauts enough power to make it home. Another team worked on air scrubbers so the astronauts had oxygen. Another recalculated the path home. The teams of technical expertise made the difference. In 52 years, that aspect has not changed. The MER team is always anticipating the mission's next moves, ready to jump in at a moment's notice, something they've been practicing. Sitting in the MER manager console, and honestly, any console that's being supported, it's um, really intense. Uh, the simulations, I think, prove that to everyone. Usually, by the end of an eight-hour shift or so, you're ready for a, a break. As we've been telling you, Artemis One is an unmanned mission to test the hardware and the software that will be carrying astronauts to and through space. But that doesn't mean that the Orion crew capsule will be flying empty. Although humans have traveled to space for decades, there are still many unknowns, especially when it comes to new equipment and traveling farther than ever before. With safety top of mind, NASA has a very special crew for its first flight of the Artemis program. Three high-tech mannequins equipped with sensors will monitor conditions future astronauts will encounter. Sitting center is Commander Munikin Campos, whose chair will measure vibration and acceleration forces atop the new space launch system. And Campos will be wearing the new Orion Crew survival system suit to be worn by his future human counterparts during those critical moments of launch and return. These custom-sized suits are pressurized, fire retardant, have a built-in waste disposal system, and provide temperature control and radiation protection for up to six days if needed. In deep space, astronauts will face radiation amounts unlike anything we deal with here on Earth. That's where Campos's companions, Helga and Zohar, come in. Known as phantoms, each is packed with more than 5,600 sensors and radiation detectors. Scientists will be looking for more information on radiation loads on skin, muscles, bones, and internal organs, which is why Helga will wear a new protective vest. Once these phantoms return, scientists can compare radiation exposure between the two and improve protection for future space missions. Did you catch that? 
Munikin Campos, named after Arturo Campos, the hero for the Apollo 13 mission who was in the mission evaluation room. I think that is so cool. So you see, NASA does have a sentimental side. As a matter of fact, also inside Artemis is a special payload. The official flight kit is 120 pounds of mementos and culturally significant items that will become gifts upon return. We're talking patches and flags and pins and the like. And Snoopy is also on board. Yeah, Snoopy, he's an ambassador of sorts for NASA. And a Snoopy plush is the zero gravity indicator inside the Orion capsule. So he'll float when they hit space. Now there's also 245 silver Snoopy pins inside. These are cherished awards given by astronauts to NASA employees and contractors who contributed to success and safety of the human space program. Not that new rockets and the next generation space capsule are enough. NASA is also testing their ability to take other science experiments for a ride. CubeSats are shoebox sized satellites with science experiments and demonstrations that have been tucked into the inner cryogenic propulsion system to be deployed as Orion departs about two hours after liftoff. Each of the 10 CubeSats on board have their own mission, like explore the lunar surface, flying by asteroids, measuring radiation, and of course, taking pictures. Now, one of them has been built by a volunteer group and will be demonstrating a first of its kind plasma thruster, as well as deep space communication and space weather observation. The tiny tech has huge potential to redefine science in space. Next on Inside Artemis, mission updates just by asking. Details on the latest partnership taking flight. And NASA says Artemis 1 is the first in a series of increasingly complex missions to come. We'll break down their plans to get humans back on the moon when Inside Artemis continues. Welcome back to Inside Artemis. A lot of folks have asked how they can follow along with this mission. So have you tried this? Alexa, take me to the moon. For the first time in 50 years, NASA will be returning to the moon with Artemis 1. I'll be on board for the journey to test out how I can make astronauts' jobs easier and more enjoyable on future missions. How cool is that? Alexa technology is along for the ride. It's a joint venture between Amazon and Cisco that has been built into Orion, so astronauts will be able to get voice-activated assistance in space. The NASA program, called Callisto, will allow astronauts to ask for current mission information, dim the lights, adjust the temperature, even get news and sports scores hundreds of thousands of miles from home. Interesting side note, Callisto is the name of one of the canine hunting companions of the Greek goddess Artemis. Now, as for the future of the Artemis program, NASA says this is just the beginning of an increasingly complex series of missions that they already have in the works. Artemis II will have the crew and is planned for 2024. Four astronauts will head for lunar orbit on a 10-day mission to test life support systems. The Orion capsule and space launch system for this are already in production. On Artemis III, astronauts will return to the surface of the moon for the first time in more than 50 years. The first woman and person of color will take the next giant leaps for mankind at the lunar south pole, where scientists believe water ice is located. They'll camp on the moon for a week doing science experiments before returning to Orion in lunar orbit for a journey back to Earth. Beyond that, NASA has plans for longer duration, deeper space missions that will not only include a lunar habitat, but a space station orbiting the moon that would be used as a platform to launch to Mars. Still to come, the pride inside Artemis. We've had major leadership roles using our expertise in power, propulsion, mechanisms, materials, communication. So across the board, lots of energy and some absolutely best work that's ever been done coming out of Cleveland, Ohio. Welcome back. Artemis One is the culmination of decades of work by tens of thousands of skilled people, and they are incredibly proud to be a part of history. I've always been excited about manned spaceflight. I worked on the space shuttle before I came to the Orion program, and 
Um, you know, it's that pushing the boundaries. It's it's going further than we've gone before. And as a little kid, I was I grew up watching space stuff, and I was just I couldn't get enough of NASA, right? And then to see the hardware come together and see spaceships being built and flowing, it's it's amazing. And it, the little the little kid in me gets excited still. To be a part of it and know that there are crew on board, and when they come back safely, to know that you are part of that is is very rewarding. The favorite part is the is the history that has come before us and the history that has still yet to be written. We are in the middle of it. It still, still shocks me sometimes to, to think that I'm gonna be sitting in the Mission Control Center. It's just it's like one of those childhood dreams that I wasn't sure that would ever come true. I don't know that it was even a dream that I knew that I had. <laughs> it was just kind of this uh, really cool thing that I, I got a chance to do. I have worked the Orion program uh, since the inception, and so this is an op opportunity to go from uh, a clean sheet of paper to actually rolling out of the VAB with the real thing. Some people work their whole career you know, on this vehicle thus far, and uh, to see it fly is going to be really tremendous for them, so we're, we're super excited. On the day of launch, it'll be time for folks like myself to sit back and watch because we'll be turning it over to the mission management team. They'll be the one that are literally pushing the button and making it go. And from there, it's going to be just a spectacular moment. There's a lot of pride, everybody working this team, and I'm so proud of them, and, and that they'll be so excited to get to this point. I am confident somewhere along that mission that I'm going to feel a lot of happiness for this great team, just a wonderful team to work with. I think people are, you know, somewhat tired because we've done so much work to get here. But the excitement level is amazing. On behalf of the 3 News team, thank you for joining us for Inside Artemis. Stay tuned for launch.